So I'll, I'll start with a short video, maybe it's the easiest explanation of what we are trying to do. George and Juan are active cryptocurrency users. They do business transactions on a daily basis. But every time they want to make a transaction, a feeling of doubt remains. Can I trust this person? This kind of doubt and risk affect each one of the 350,000 business transactions that happen every day. Imagine how many more transactions there would be if the level of trust would be higher. The days of worrying are coming to an end with the help of InsurePal Blockchain Business Transactions Insurance. Like other InsurePal insurances, it is based on social proof, a psychological mechanism that forces people to play fair through peer pressure. Here's how it makes all business on the blockchain safer. Juan and George can opt for an insurance smart contract before they make a business <laughs> transaction. So if Juan tricks George, InsurePal covers for George's loss. On the other hand, Juan and all of his endorsers will be given a penalty. Consequently, every single endorser gets a special social proof trust score rating that can seriously affect their credibility. InsurePal will strengthen the trust between all who make business transactions. This way, it will create a global network of people who do business transparently. And because of... Okay. So that's a short intro uh, of, of our product. I'll try to maybe uh, explain it a little further. Uh, on one side, we are trying to move the today's insurance model, which is which, where, where, where everything is held, held centralized. As Michael said at the beginning, when Equifax came to UK, uh, the same Equifax that holds most of the data of their clients centralized. What we are trying to do is to put some of those data uh, away from the Insurers. On this side, we have two ways of, let's say, underwriting each person. I can check your Facebook. I can use maybe even Cambridge Analytica to do that. Uh, I can put uh, some gadgets in your car. Uh, I can, as usually, I mean, my background was uh, fraud detection in large insurers. So we usually checked when there was some fraudulent claims, we check the Facebook profiles, we check the Google links, uh, we check the, any other social media to see the clients. The other way is we can do it also that we ask friends whether they would endorse them. Uh, I saw only 30% of people are willing to trust their friends, but that's still, still a good uh, amount of it. And we are trying to build the model on that way. Uh, here is how it works. Uh, if I have, uh, if Wina has, a, let's say, a car insurance for 1,000 uh, pounds, I say, I know him, I know he's not driving well, but I would still bet on him uh, around 100 pounds in order to reduce his premium. And in that sense, I am uh, giving additional information to the insurer and helping them to, on one side, I'm reducing the premium for Vinay and I'm helping to do a better run, right? The same you can do also for other things. We have currently around four or five clients which are uh, using this kind of a social proofing for gig economy. A typical example, we have a client in Switzerland where if you rent an apartment, they ask, since they know, don't know you, they ask that you put at least uh, free, uh, free rents in advance, uh, in a deposit, uh, which you get back when uh, you return the keys. Uh, what we are offering is that you ask three or four of your friends if they endorse you, if they put their credit cards, we just can check their credit cards if they are alive. If they are alive, uh, they, those friends would vouch for the same amount. <laughs> okay, on one side that's bringing cheaper premiums, uh, improved profitability, and uh, it also gives the benefits to, to 
to uh, society. Blockchain can enable expansion of that model to a whole network. So a kind of a uh, recursive transit, transitive deductible, uh, which can be used if we have, uh, let's say, a lot of identities or a lot of clients in the space. Okay, I'll switch then to the some of the. Uh, so, uh, in uh, the case that I vouch for somebody. Uh, and there's a dispute, then I always call, call V9 to help us. So I would ask maybe to uh, help us to how we resolve some of the contracts, smart contracts, which we have, uh, let's say, at the, at the insurer or at gig economies, how to enable them to do it quicker. V9, can you help us? So basically, uh, currently most of the insurers are resolving the contracts on the ports. Some of the contracts could be also resolved easier than the smart contracts. Yes. Uh, however, as I heard today, only one, uh, until now only one, Yes, this is, this would be uh, Ian's contract that we're referring to from the nineties. Ian, are you there somewhere? Where are we seeing? Yes. So I mean, there is um, there's no doubt at all that arbitration is binding, right? It's a very old, very stable process. Uh, there's no doubt at all that arbitration works. The tricky part is connecting the smart contract to the arbitrator. Because the smart contract is just a chunk of code that lives on the blockchain. Um, there's nothing in that chunk of code uh, which can necessarily even be tied to a legal pers uh, persona. right? So if this code is signed with a key, how do we know that that key is your key? Because if you give a copy of that key to somebody else, either one of you could be the person that signed the document. So tracing the necessary chains of sort of legal cause and effect between a smart contract and a nominated individual who can then consent to the arbitration, uh, all of that stuff is the tr kind of tricky step-by-step -step legal procedural work that you have to do if you want to be able to use binding arbitration to settle these kinds of disputes. How would we resolve the disputes when uh, people are vouching for each other's identities? Well, so the, the simple case is that you first take the money. Right? If something goes wrong, the first thing you do is you take the money. And if they decide that they would like their money back, now they're the one that raises the dispute. And you have things that look like terms of service agreements, which say in the event, uh, event of a dispute being raised, you first talk to you know, a, a neutral third party that will try and have a dialogue about what went wrong, and that neutral third party will attempt to resolve it in a way that everybody consents to. So you have a mediation step, presumably. And in most cases, the mediation step will resolve the problem because it will be a simple misunderstanding. But remember that you are holding on to the money at this point. So if the mediation step doesn't work, you can basically shrug your shoulders and your customer will be like, damn it, this is not just right. This is just not how it's going to be. And at this point, they can escalate to a more formal process, at which point the decisions become very binding. Right? They have full legal force. As a result, people tend to do things like bring their lawyers and this is where there may be a mismatch between the sums of money at play and the degree of inconvenience required to have a litigation. And the bridge for this mismatch is, of course, mutualization. So every pays, everybody pays an additional 25 cents on their transaction fee. That money goes into a bucket, and that bucket then pays for the legal expenses of the parties in the event that a litigation occurs, or a, a, a formal mediation. Uh, sorry, a formal arbitration. So basically for each premium, we would add like 25 cents for, for that part. And you wind up with a kind of bucket of money, which is like a legal defense fund, which is used to pay the costs of full process to do asset recovery. Because the thing is that the integrity of the process is much more important than the efficiency of the process. Right? We're all used to completely unaccountable dispute resolution mechanisms like eBay, where if something goes wrong on eBay, your chance of actually sorting it out is pretty low. Yeah. Right? 
and they have, theoretically, they have mechanisms in place for sorting it out. But practically speaking, those mechanisms are kind of weird and opaque, and it's not like you could just talk to somebody and explain what happened. And they greatly favor, uh, the, the decision-making uh, event tends to favor the buyer, but the procedural knowledge is all with the sellers. So you, you wind up with two unequal forces contesting. Um, all of those mechanisms you know, you just kind of play the odds and you think that it will all be okay, and you continue to trade on eBay and once in a while you lose some value. But the general feeling that you get is that eBay is kind of a sketchy environment to do business in. And if the alternative was that they had very, very high quality arbitration, so that when something went wrong it was handled by a, you know, a really competent authority, even if the transaction fees were a little higher, we would all feel much better about eBay. And this is how it works in high trust societies. Everybody pays taxes and the taxes pay for the courts. And there's been an enormous amount of work in the UK on streamlining the cost of court processes, not just for small claims but further up, by doing things like changing the way that case management is done. So rather than having an environment where people can spend an infinite amount of money on lawyers, there are things like caps on legal fees that will be awarded if the uh, dispute is ruled against somebody. And all these mechanisms have been done to try and streamline these processes. But isn't true that people are, let's say, we see at least in insurance that for small sums, they usually don't go to court because simply they say, well, it's lost, lost battle. Well, this is why mediation is important, right? So if you have a mediation process where a neutral third party comes in and tries to make it work, in most cases, just having a neutral third party there will resolve the problem, right? Somebody will look at it and the agreement might be like, oh yeah, we have made a mistake here, or you know, why don't we split this with you 50-50? And you can resolve it because the mediator is backed up by arbitration. So if the mediator can't resolve the problem, there's always a way of escalating. And because we all know there's a way of escalating, we know that justice is available, and at that point, we are more willing to trust the processes at the lower level. If the mediator's word is final and there's no way of going above the mediator's head, then how do you know if you're gonna get a bad mediator? You tend not to trust the process. But if you know that if the mediator does the wrong thing, you have access to a higher level system that will correct their errors, you come in with an expectation the mediator will behave more professionally. So the more you know, rigid, solid process you have at the very top level, that kind of flows down through the rest of the systems. Okay. So even the front level technical support folks, if they know that it is you know, technical support, then mediation, then maybe expert determination, then arbitration, you kind of have this you know, tiered response. Um, you know for sure that your technical support people understand that what they're doing matters. So the first point of contact where something is going to get resolved is dealing with the extension of the authority of the ultimate arbitrators uh, rather than just the internal processes inside of a company. It's very, very much like the kind of processes that give us trust in the national courts. And it's that form of trust, this trust in a central authority that really understands the law and that will administer justice fairly, that we want to bring into the blockchain space. What you're seeing that I uh, said, I have a lot of requests from so-called gig economies, mm. where people are saying in order to onboard somebody, let's say to a renting platform or to anything, they say, okay, if you bring additional social proof, mm -hmm. we will put you on the platform. Yep. But still on the top of it, if I rent your car, and if, my, if I crash it, it's going to be cost 70,000 euros. Mm -hmm. You will vouch for, or your friends will vouch for, let's say for 5,000. Yep. But the rest has to be covered with insurance. Yes, absolutely. And th this is the question about how big is the risk pool? So if you have these kind of approaches, but the risk pool is basically five people, you can't get the kind of system performance that you want. Um, you need a much, much larger risk pool, right? So you know, here's your risk pool. If that network goes out to be 50,000 people, you'd have the size of a typical insurance pool, right? If it's five million people, that'd be something like house insurance. And when the pools get really large, that extra 25 cents or the $100 a year you charge somebody for insurance, turns into such a lot of money that it covers almost all risks. So, as Michael Manelli was saying earlier on, um, there's a whole question about scale, right? You need network effects to get these things working because you have to push over the hump where you don't really have enough insurance to make it work. 
because this, the volatility is too large. You need to get lots of in, uh, people with the same kinds of risks in a bucket. And that's how you begin to smooth the risk. So if you have something like that, you know, if you're dealing with $70,000 worth of risk, you're going to need tens of thousands of people before you can split the risk so finally that nobody notices. You know, how much insurance claim can you pay in a year before you pay the pain? Maybe a hundred or two hundred dollars. So a seventy thousand dollar risk is going to be have to spread over th uh, three hundred and fifty people, and you can sort of estimate the kind of risk tolerance of each individual and say, well, how much is in the buckets? So does everybody know how Lloyd's of London uh, works? So you know you have this kind of social network model. And at the top end of that, you have a bunch of people who have you know, yachts and country homes and Rolls Royces. And if something goes badly enough wrong that these people are asked to pay the claims uh, that Lloyds is generating, these people begin to have to sell their country homes and their Rolls Royces. Um, and there was a famous bloodbath. How long ago was the bloodbath? Let's say 15, 20 years? Something like that? Where there was just you know, a series of unfortunate events and an enormous number of you know, wealthy uh, English names got hit very, very hard, and that caused a bunch of restructuring of risk at Lloyd's. So you know, the notion is always that you're going to have to th you know, basically spread the risk thinly enough that each individual can tolerate it. And that applies as much to uh, legal fees as it applies to the actual settlements. Because the difference between you being, you being fined and you having to pay an expensive lawyer, it's all money coming out of your pocket. So you need to find ways of pooling the risk of access to the expensive lawyers and pooling the risk of the uh, actual payments. Uh, that's why in terms of scaling, we think that the insurance business is one of the ways to scale. Mm. Because to onboard large amount of clients, insurance is one of the ways. Yeah. And we see in UK, that if you offer, let's say, to a client uh, insurance premium that it's at least 80 pounds cheaper, they would, might consider to go uh, and use the social proof insurance. Yeah. Uh, we have also really good feedback in, from Dutch insurers, maybe because you had this uh, event in... in, in, in yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we've been warming that for a while. I'm glad would you're be. <laughs> Uh, so basically, that's a kind of a, in short, concept. Mm -hmm. um, are there any questions or discussions? Glad to, glad to answer. Well, so I, I think there's one thing that we should talk about here a little, which is the sort of notion that we're on-ramping towards a future, right? You know, the, the, there are a series of small steps, right? You know, the first insurance product, there'll be a bunch of, you know, disputes which will happen on the blockchain and we'll see Regardian contracts and dispute resolution will all kick in. All of these kinds of processes um, are steps towards a long-term equilibrium. Right? And the long-term equilibrium is that you get a vastly higher quality of life because you get much less uninsured risk. Right? All of these little risks, like you, do, you drop your cell phone uh, and it breaks. You know, if you had immediate replacement where somebody will bicycle to you with the exact same phone and when it arrives all your backups are restored, suddenly this is no longer a big deal. And the price of that service might only be 15 or 20 pounds a year as long as it's spread over a wide enough risk pool. And life is filled with crazy little inconveniences like this that are huge suckers of time and money when they happen to you, but they happen infrequently enough that they're insurable. So I like to think that we're you know, basically building out, you, know, you guys are leading on this process, a world in which basically, if you have a little additional money, you can smooth out nearly all of the random little inconveniences, and that's a combination of payment and service. A good point, because uh, that's why we have also a lot of interest so, from so-called gig economies, mm -hmm. where people are using, let's say, um, tools or, or cars for, for a few minutes or for for one hour, mm. renting them out, mm. and to smoothen that process of onboarding or, or also insuring it, you need to have a different way to approach it. Yeah. 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 We've got time for just one quick question. Great. I had a question about the insurance side of this, because I think traditionally insurers have been very good at taking premiums, and they're not often so quick to pay out when the insurer will when the insurable event happens. And underlying insurance is this idea of sort of good faith and 
because you can't you can't DD every piece of information, so you rely on the information that you're given being given in good faith. What happens when your third party endorsement is given by somebody and it turns out that that is incorrect? Does that affect your ability to pay out on the policy? How are you going to streamline this to make certain that there's an indemnity if the social endorsement isn't is incorrect? But will you still pay out? Well, I would start from maybe from a from a different angle. Uh, today, if you pay 100 pounds of the insurance, you pay in motor insurance you pay around 60 pounds for uh, for let's say for uh, claims, out of that is 10 to 15% fraudulent. So basically what we are trying is to reduce that part at least a little. There will be still cases, of course, when people will be having their fake identities or uh, will not pay. But that's usually, we see that reduction of the claims by using social proof is between 20 and 40%. No, no system is ideal. Also, our system is not ideal, but it can bring some of the, let's say, roots of the insurance, which was at the beginning, it was mutual insurance among people. People insured among each, each other. I mean, the, this is where the kind of peer-to-peer -peer nature of the blockchain comes in. Because the overheads in organizing an insurance pool peer-to-peer, -peer, where they're insuring each other for 100,000 people, overwhelm existing approaches, you wind up with a central third party. Right? If you wind up with basically protocol-based projects, you could build very large risk pools with an absolutely minimal third party that really just does standards processes and dispute resolution. Right? And we do dispute resolution, you do the standards, the product design, you wind up with very, very thin intermediaries. Um, and I think that that potentially produces much, much more fluid and elastic and functional insurance markets. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Thank you.